Hi there, welcome to Politicket. I'm Dave Owen. I am extremely honored to uh, be trying to substitute for Senator John Johnson, who I hear is a little busy these days. Um, so I'll be taking over for this week. And we've got a, a great guest, uh, Dave Callis. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Dave. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, my name is Dave Callis. Uh, I work up on the Hill during the session as a lobbyist, and I also uh, have a client that I work with as their executive director. It's an association called the Critical Infrastructure Materials Coalition. Mouthful, I know. Yeah. But it's an association made up of companies that uh, mine and produce sand and gravel. And, and produce aggregates. everything that yeah. we need for critical yeah. infrastructure. Concrete, asphalt, those guys. So... Uh People who watch the podcast know that I've been involved with the Parley's Canyon uh, Quarry Project. I know a little bit about it, not as much as you. You worked prior for? Uh, yes, in the past I've worked for uh, Clyde Companies. For who, Clyde Companies. Yeah, they they operate uh, Geneva Rock, Sun Rock, so others in that industry, and and have some of the uh, operations, mining operations you'll see around town. So both of us have a bill we're following this year yes. that we're involved with. You want to tell us? It's a, it. There's so much disinformation out there about it. You know, yeah. the 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 beef that I have with the opposition on these things is that they can never seem to tell the truth. They, yeah. You know, they we wish that they would just do that. But and we'll get some into that. But what is the bill? Do we have a number yet? Yes. So it's Senate Bill One Seventy Two. And who's the sponsor? And the sponsor is Senator Hinkins. Oh, it is. Yes. It is uh, Senator Hinkins. Yeah. Okay, and so, uh, and what is it about? Well, you're right. You, you hear a lot of people say the sky is falling. It's not. Once I think once people look at this, they say, "Oh, okay, that makes sense." Yeah, because what what I wanted to ask you, what yeah. does the bill do? It, it's it's quite simple, really. It's just it's kind of reaffirming what is already in state code that says, if you're a really old mining operation, meaning I, I like to call them a legacy operation. You've been around since statehood or before statehood or perhaps before a county or a city was there. Then those operations have the right to continue operating, even though the city came in later or a county and started changing the zoning and changing things. And, and oftentimes they want that operator to leave and abandon their mining operation. This just gives that operation some security in their private property right to say, hey, this is our property, we're a mine, and we're, we get to continue doing that. And a lot of these properties, and we, I, I tend to think in terms of Salt Lake County, but that's, not, that's certainly not the whole thing. But it seems like a lot of these mining operations have been there. And when they were first put there, they were in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Correct? They were. And absolutely. Then, so what is that what's bringing the pressure on this? Well, yeah. And it's a, uh, you know, the really quick history of this is the vested mining is, like I said, it's already in the statute. It began years ago when Kennecott was looking at being kind of run out of town uh, by the county who wasn't working with them. And so... The state said, you know, Kennecott's an important operator and an important business and private property owner in Utah. And so they put this statute in place. When it when it was made, it applied to uh, mining, which is kind of when, when you think of mining, it's bedrock. It's old, uh, solid rock. But Ken what wasn't, yeah, yeah, what wasn't fully included at the time was sand and gravel. And so this bill is saying... You know, we have vested mining currently in the law. We have some vesting for sand and gravel, but we're going to make sure that sand and gravel, and if you're mining limestone or if you're mining sand and gravel, you, it's treated the same. And the barrier is still, you know, you're, you're a legacy operator before the city. Now, I know that people could tune into this podcast and say, oh, my gosh, they're talking about sand and gravel. And so I want to get to that. I want to get to why this matters to people, because it really is critical. But first, can we address, we, we're, we've kind of talked about what the bill does. Yeah. There's a lot out there. The opposition is, is very busy. Mm -hmm. And what does the bill not do? Oh, that's a great question. So I, what, I, what I've heard some people say is, that, hey, there's going to be this gold rush 
of people and speculators going out and buying all these like a big land. Yes, yeah, a land grab of people going out and buying these uh, parcels and turning, you know, we're going to have a gravel pit everywhere. That's not the case because, again, this only applies to those operations who were permitted and who have existed before the city or the county. So in other words, vested means existing. Yeah, Is that the, what it means? The, 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 the concept of vesting in and of itself means you, you predate. A lot of times people will say, oh, we're grandfathered. That, that's the, this is the legal way of saying that, is saying you're vested, you're grandfathered, you, you were there first, you get to continue your use. Now, I, I know people's eyes can glaze over on this stuff, and I always, I do a lot of political work, and I often tell my, the candidates that I work with, you got to tell me why I care. Yeah. You got to tell me why I care. Why do people care about this? Well, because we are all consumers of sand and gravel and uh, aggregate and building materials. We all use it. We may not realize it, but we do. We use a lot of it. And um, it builds our homes, schools. You think about the big issues uh, up at the legislature, uh, water, um, housing and housing affordability, transportation. And the growth. The growth. Uh, growth and all those things are, are dependent on this industry. Uh, as as a supplier of building materials. And so it matters. It impacts us all. That's what I pointed out is is people think, it, why, why are you even talking about this? Why what would I care? Well, everybody drives. Everybody works somewhere. Everybody lives somewhere. Everybody flushes a toilet yes. and everybody drinks water. Mm -hmm. And none of those things happen. And I would go further and say most of us get on an airplane every now and then. Yep. You know, there are all kinds of things that we do, and it all depends on this. And it's amazing how much gets used. Can yeah. you throw some numbers yeah, out Yeah, it is. That? So currently in Utah, and it, it, I'm shocked every time I look at the number because it continues to rise year over year. But the if you take all of the consumed sand gravel aggregates on average and spread it out over the population, so an average, the in Utah we're averaging about 15 tons of aggregate consumption per per Okay, I person. want people to think about that for a minute because it's easy to throw a number like that out there. Yeah. How much did you just say? 15 tons. 15 tons. Yeah. So 30,000 pounds of yes, sand. 30, it, you know, you're consuming 30,000 like pounds. This has got to be a ridiculous topic for some people, but that's a lot. And it when is. you look at the growth rates along. So what's the consequence? And so what we were talking about before we started was that what's happening in some of these places that are trying to zone out mm -hmm. these uh, sand and gravel operations that have been there for a long time. Yeah. And they're trying to zone them and, and get them to have to close down, go away. What's the consequence of that? Well, the consequence is you won't have them there and everything will cost more. So your homes will cost more, your your roads will cost more. In fact, there's a great example I like to share with people. You may remember a couple of years ago, the, the state and UDOT conducted a, a I-15 widening project from Point of the Mountain down through Lehigh. They call it the Tech Corridor. Yes, it was called the Tech Corridor. Yeah. Uh, and and the number for that project, the price was about four hundred million dollars. Right. That's what the uh, the the construction was. So we we did an analysis and said, okay, most of that project uh, was was uh, the aggregates came from Point of the Mountain. So, so right there, really close. They're right there. Yeah. So we said. What if we took all the material instead of Point of the Mountain, which is one of these operations that people want to get rid of and move out of town? So let's assume we did move it out of town. Where, how much would that have changed the project? And it was a seventy million dollar increase. So four hundred million, four hundred and seventy million, just bringing that aggregate from Tooele County. Yeah, and that's the problem. What I see is if you bring the aggregate from somewhere else, number one, what do they complain about? Emissions, right? Mm -hmm. Is it going to lessen emissions? You, the more you drive, the further you have to drive <laughs> to haul, the more it is. So what it really amounts to is they want to outsource emissions. Yep. They want Tooele County or Nevada or someplace yeah. else, any place but here. Yeah. And it's so much more efficient to be working off of uh, gravel and aggregate. I, I think I thought about that. I was stunned when I heard that number, $70 yeah. million. It, it is shocking. The yeah. transportation cost is incredibly high. In fact, at about 40, 50 miles, the cost of what you have inside the truck, the cost of that sand and gravel is less than the cost of the transportation. 
So 40, 50 yeah. miles, that is, suddenly uh, yeah, it's like you're, it's not worth it anymore. Okay, you got me as a taxpayer, I do care. Yes, you as a taxpayer, um, as well, a homeowner as let's well. Let's take a little break here, and uh, uh, I hope we're keeping people engaged. Yeah. And we'll come back and talk about the bigger picture. Great, thank you. The cost of distance. Quarry opponents claim their interest is in saving the environment, but it really comes down to move it far away from us. Okay, but the further we have to go to get sand and gravel, the more it costs in money and emissions. When transport distance doubles, emissions also double. So exactly whose environment are they trying to save? Meanwhile, ask yourself, will it cost more or less and pollute more or less if you bring gravel in from somewhere like Nevada? Parley's I-80 South Quarry will help Utah work right. Work right, Utah. Hi there, Dave Owen. Trying to sub in for uh, Senator John Johnson, who I think is an incredible host. And I'll, I, I, I can't do what he does, but I'll do what I can. Um, anyway, we're talking with Dave Callis. He is the executive director of The Mouthful. <laughs> Critical Infrastructure Materials Coalition. Yes. Say that 10 times yes. fast. <laughs> uh, but it, what we're talking about the materials that we all use every day, whether we know it or not, we've had major freeway build rebuilds uh, over the last couple of years. I know because I've dealt with two of them, I-215 mm -hmm. on yeah. the east side and then on I-80. And we were just talking about the tech corridor down in Utah county and it's endless and on the way up here today uh or, or we had highway 89 yeah. it just had a major oh, that's a big one mm -hmm. i can't even imagine how much sand gravel all aggregates went into those projects it's a tremendous amount for those projects in fact udah is a big consumer of the product and of course that means we the people who fund those road projects are the consumer but but it, it's not just there i mean the average home is I don't remember the exact number, but it's okay. many, many tons yeah. of aggregates just to build a home from the driveway, the foundation, the bricks, the the mortar, everything. So and we could see the growth there. around yeah. it. Well, I said I wanted to talk a little more about the general idea because another thing that's going around is this bill in the legislature is yeah. about the Parley's quarry. Yeah. So you're right. That's a claim that's going around, and that's just wrong. This bill is a and and let me point out that. It kind of doesn't apply to the Parley's Quarry. It, it, right, because part, what's happening in Parley's uh, Canyon is there's a, a vet, an existing operation, vested operation, with a permit. And so this bill is not giving them a permit. It's not giving them a vested right. They already have that. So this bill is really about clarifying, hey, these vested rights exist, and we're bringing sand and gravel into the vesting process. Th those aren't sand and gravel operations. Those are mining uh, limestone. Up in that, it was yeah. a mining district. Yeah, yeah so we've said a lot of so people. when folks talk about parleys in this, this is a different issue. This is really bringing sand and gravel into the party. But the idea is to protect access to the resources that we have here in Utah, so we don't have to bring them from right. other places. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Absolutely. Do we care about property rights and and the ability to? You know, you mine copper or you mine gold, you send it to China or to New York City. You mine aggregates, you send it to your neighborhood to build your home. And Utah has always been, and, and sometimes people are critical of it, but we've always been very good about private property rights. Right. And furthermore, I think we have to remain that way because the alternative is, is, in my opinion, really, really damaging. You're right. But Utah, we often say, and certainly with our growth patterns, we're where California was 25 years ago. Tell me about that. We were talking a little bit about California. Yeah, well, if we're where California was 25 years ago, hopefully we're not headed in that direction. And California has, they have, through, through zoning, have really eliminated uh, most aggregate producers, uh, mining operations. And folks didn't want it in their neighborhood. It got further and further out until really there's only a few left. And those operations are not enough to meet the demand. So if you can believe it, in Southern California, a lot of their sand, gravel, and aggregates are being barged in. So they mine them in British Explain Columbia. Explain that. Yeah. So they're mining in Canada. In Canada. Loading, hauling it. Hauling them by port. train and truck to a port. Loading it on. Mm -hmm. On a barge and taking it all the way but down. But those, bar those barges are all electric, right? <laughs> oh, no? I, I doubt it. But uh, yeah, they bring them down through the port of Long Beach and offload them there. And then they 
from there they haul them to the ready mix plant or the hot plant, plant. Yep. That's one of the things that I've, uh, that's one balloon I've tried to pop during this process is they, it, it, there seems to be this idea that if you open a new gravel quarry, then it's going to produce more gravels and more aggregate and, and therefore there's going to be more pollution. And I always go, no, it's not like you stockpile the stuff. It's right. kind of, it's kind of just in time inventory. It is. is it not? You're absolutely right. So, what drives the amount of gravel and aggregate? We'll just use that aggregate products. What drives that? How well, much we use in a given year? Uh, it, it's really uh, each each business kind of figures that out about what what their customer demand is going right. forward. And so, if if they have a big job coming up, an I-15 rebuild. They have to start producing more and stock uh, building the stockpile in the yard, but that's being going out the gate as fast as they can pile. Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course they're going to stockpile mm -hmm. a little, yeah. but there's no there's no interest in going and filling a warehouse full no, of no, aggregate no, rock. No. I mean, that there's no no reason. no. You, you they they. I mean, it comes off the mountain and it's in a truck. Sometimes the same day, sometimes within a few days. So aggregate is a given. You've mm -hmm. got to use it if you're going to build. Correct? Absolutely. Yep. So the only given is how much. And, and there's plenty of reasons for keeping our environment clean, right? I don't yeah. think anybody disagrees with that. Well, and this bill, uh, let me be clear, the, the Senate Bill 172 doesn't exempt anybody from environmental oh, standards. Yeah. They, yeah. The operators still have to have a permit from the Division of Air Quality. They have to have their wa water quality in place. They have to go through all the endangered species and all the... Uh, revegetation. They have to have a bond. So they, they still have to do all those things. I do know what they've gone through up in Parley's and it's uh, it's incredible. The, yeah. the level of uh, of scientific consulting that you need to bring in, environmental experts, yeah. uh, all these kinds of folks that, that have to clear the thing before it ever gets permitted. Yeah, and it takes, uh, oftentimes it takes years and, and hundreds millions. of thousands, if not yeah. millions of dollars. And the the difficult thing we're seeing is, uh, in in response to growth, s counties, Salt Lake County, Utah County, others are uh, removing sand and gravel or mining Which from is exactly zones. Exactly what you just said. So California. they they have to now go somewhere else. So you can't just go open something new in Utah County, for example, if you're within like a mile of a zone that allows for residential use. So uh, that's a tricky way of saying we don't want you in our county. And so they've forced them out. And now these are piling up in, say, Tooele County, who's saying, well, why is why are we mining everything and exporting it to Salt Lake and, and Provo? Right. Now they're going to have mm -hmm. to deal with it because, yes, there are problems from mining gravel. Yeah. Of course there are. There are, are exogenous uh factors that we wish weren't there, but they are. And it's something that we have to be able to put up with. They are. Uh, there. There's impacts of use, no, no doubt. But uh, sand and gravel operators have been great at uh, dealing and managing with those impacts with uh, mitigating dust, mitigating their their hours of operation or managing those to accommodate other uses. And then post mining, the the land has a use like if you've ever been to the usana amphitheater that's a gravel pit uh the south town expo oh, center Godwood Heights. uh quarry bend in sandy yeah even point of the mountain uh, you can go on i think they have a website you can go on and see what their plans are because they see light at the end of the tunnel for their their mining and so that's going to be a great use but they're they need the ability to Finish but in project. the meantime, yeah. you know, we don't want to end up like California. I'm not sure we could barge our sa sand and gravel down from Canada here. Yeah. So uh, I'll tell you what I'd like to do, uh, because from the beginning on this, I've seen its connection to greater issues, mm -hmm. larger issues, lands issues, for example. Yeah. And and one of the things that I've said for a long time is, uh, and and I've heard it, I'm not saying it was original, but all genuine wealth comes from the earth. And by that, we either grow it or we mine it or we pump it or we drill it or we do something. Yeah. But everything comes from the earth. Everything else derives from that. Does it appear to you that there's a concerted effort on the part of some to cut us off from those resources? Oh, absolutely. This and gets a little political. It, it does get political, but there's clearly uh, an effort by some to uh, eliminate 
those uses to eliminate, you know, agriculture, uh, mining and natural resource extraction. And, and we see it in this uh, industry as well, that wherever you go, they say, don't go there. Um, we were uh, we were at a, an event where we were getting a permit for a mine in the valley and they showed protesters showed up and said, this is the worst place in the state for this operation. You need to go 100 or 200 miles away. Well, a few months later, we were 100 or 200 miles away at another city trying to get permitted. And the same folks showed up and said, this is the worst place for these operations. Exactly. So. These are hobbyists. Yeah. I mean, they're people, or they're getting paid. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, that that's my point is that there seems to be, and all of it's disingenuous, all of it's dishonest, because the reality is it does not save the environment. These are things we have to have. We're going to get them somewhere. We have to have them. It makes a lot more sense to get them close to home, and that's one of the things that I've defended the Parley's project on is it's on a major east-west freight corridor oh yeah i mean the, the there's it's course, next door to a six-lane like freeway you know it's wilderness it's like yeah. the it's up in the wind rivers or something it's not right it's a, it's actually a, a mining district it's a mining district yeah. and it's on a major east-west freight corridor yeah. and when you look at where the growth patterns are granted weaver county's going nuts i mean there are lots of places in the states so, the state where there's a lot of growth but Summit, Wasatch, and Salt Lake are certainly three that matter, and yeah. it's right there, and it's yeah. easily accessible. And we don't have the numbers on computing how much less emission and so forth uh, will be used by having that open and running. But but from what we learned from, from you on the tech corridor, we have an idea. Yeah, both in terms of uh, increased emissions, if you have to drive further, increased costs, uh, the cost and the, the scaling of cost is not like equal. The, the more you go, the steeper that curve gets. So it gets more and more expensive with each mile. And so you if you're if we're not willing as a community, as in a society to have these operations near us where we use it, where we consume it, then we we need to face the fact that things are going to cost a lot more, be a lot more difficult uh, to come by. And so I, I think in Utah, where we have a growth mindset, where we're managing growth, where we have lots of children who are going to need homes in the future, a lot of schools we're building, uh, we're best served by good, responsible operators who have these private property rights and allow them to uh, exercise those rights to do their operation in a good, uh, a good manner, responsible manner. And when they're done, they can put that to some other use. Well, I'll tell you what. What was it? SB SB one seventy two, and it's the sponsor is Senator Hinkins. It's David Hinkins mm -hmm. from down uh, in Carbon County. Yes. Well, I happen to know that this audience is pretty darn politically active. So if you get a chance, let your legislator know, and especially the senators, uh, that you support this thing. It's crucial for for tomorrow and for our kids. Well, I'm hoping a few folks got to the end of this, well, I this when they saw that we were talking about Zan and Gravel, uh -huh. because I think it is a vital issue. I think it ties to a lot of things. I've told a lot of people, we were paying not too long ago, five bucks a gallon for gas. That is not unrelated to zoning gravel quarries out of existence right. in the urban areas. I mean, it's, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. And I think Utah is wise and they're smart. Hear that, legislature? <laughs> you hear that, you guys? No, I think it's wise and smart to say we're not going to be California. Yeah. Let's take the steps now that, so that we can ensure access to these things for for decades to come. Yes, go. absolutely. So anyway, thanks well, very thank much you. for thanks joining for us. us. Yeah, I, I appreciate, appreciate it. it. All right.